Well, hey, everybody. Great to be with you this weekend and grow together. Now, before we dive into Bible study and be encouraged together this weekend, uh, let me say a few things on the front end. First of all, how about those Warriors going to the uh, NBA Finals? So first time in 40 years, that's a long time. And all I can say is bring on LeBron. He's going down, baby. Uh, secondly, um, the Greggs last weekend had a great wedding up in Big Sky uh, Country. Our youngest son, Logan, uh, was married. Uh, he married just a wonderful uh, young woman named Randy. Uh, she is a real sweetheart. Uh, take a look at a couple pictures here. This first picture uh, you can see during the actual ceremony, and that's all of us on the stage. And uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of that holy moment. We had a number of officers in the United States Army there, uh, my son Logan included. Uh, that second picture is actually a picture of the Gregg family, uh, the Gregg children rather, and you can see from left to right that's Ryan, then Candace, and there in his dress uniform is Logan, his new wife Randy, and then uh, Caitlin and her husband Paul. So now the Greggs have six children. And uh, all I can say is bring on the grandchildren. Third thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, honestly, kind of on a, a sad note, and I'm, I'm telling you so that uh, I, I'm requesting and, and really asking your prayers. Uh, while that wedding was actually happening, my mom, Shirley, had a pretty serious stroke. And uh, I, I would covet your prayers. She's uh, obviously going through all the protocol that follows a stroke to regain use of arms and legs, etc. Would you pray for my mom, uh, Shirley? I love her with all my heart. She's nearly 80 years old. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for that. Well, listen, let's review uh, what we talked about uh, when we talked last time about growing a David heart. Before we do that, I want to say a big thank you to Steve Hunt. Uh, Steve, who's part of our teaching team on weekends here at CTC, uh, did a great job uh, last weekend talking to us about a personal Pentecost. I want to let you guys know that the next few weekends in June, the first three weekends in June, we're going to be wrapping up our series in the life of David, this pursuit series, and I'm going to be talking to the men of the church about manhood, masculinity, fatherhood, all those vital things. And... Uh, let me just give you a, a hint, guys, uh, just to kind of give you something to chew on, think about. From a biblical perspective, a man's man is a godly man. And we'll be talking about that stuff together in the month of June. Now, we, in part one of Growing a David Heart, we said that character is destiny. We said that in order to keep our lives blessable by God, we've got to keep our lives in the place of obedience. And remember that obedience is the only maturity that God recognizes. And so we're trying to keep our lives blessable. So in part one, we talked about eight qualities that we see emerging from David's life uh, in the biblical narrative and that we want to begin to be forged in our lives also. So you'll notice, and, and you have notes that you either receive when you came in or you can uh, access them uh, digitally on version. We talked about the fact, number one, David had mercy for his enemies. He was a man of mercy. Secondly, he was a devoted worshiper. Thirdly, David was unselfishly kingdom-minded. Fourth, he had humble, eternal perspective. Fifth, David was a passionate man of prayer. Sixth, he was compassionate toward the innocent. Seventh, David was financially generous toward the things of God. And then eighth, David had moral purity. Now, not so much in his youth, or in the robust years at the pinnacle of power in middle age, but more he discovered moral purity uh, at the end of his days and demonstrated that kind of integrity that so honors God. So that's where we went in part one. And what I want to do is wrap up what it means to grow a David heart in part two. And we're only looking at two additional qualities. So you may want to fill this in. Here's number nine. Another quality that demonstrates a David heart is David mentored the next generation. Let me say that again. David mentored the next generation. You may remember Solomon, his son, was his groomed error. 
uh, error and in an act of really God's mercy and grace, uh, of course, Solomon, his mom was Bathsheba. And so how does that work? I don't know. We'll have to sort that out on the other side of eternity. Uh, nevertheless, David mentored the next generation. So I want to ask us a question before we look at a key passage in 1 Kings chapter 2, and it's this. If our children, our sons and daughters, grew up to be exactly like we are, how would that make you feel? How does that make me feel? And then there's even maybe a more important question. What are we doing about it? Because the truth of the matter is, um, don't worry that our sons and daughters aren't listening to us. Be concerned that they're watching us. And either intentionally or unintentionally, we are mentoring the next generation. Now, uh, I want you to join me in 1 Kings chapter 2. Let me read it to you. Uh, I've listed it there for you in the notes and on the presentation screens as well. Notice, uh, verse 1, when the time grew, uh, drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. And he said, my son, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So be strong, Solomon. Show yourself a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways. Keep his decrees, his commands, his laws, his requirements, as is written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper, my son, in all that you do and wherever that you go. And that the Lord may keep his promise to me that if your descendants, notice, watch how they live. I'm in verse number four. And if they walk faithfully before me with all of their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Now let's unpack this real quickly. First of all, look at verses one and two. Did you notice? It says, when the time came near for David to die. And then it says, David uh, is saying in verse 2, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Here's the first obvious insight. We are all gonna die. And we human beings live in such denial about that inevitable truth about our lives. And we do everything we can to deny it delay it, say it's not true, act like it's not there, rather than do the wise thing, which is this, get ready for the day of our death. You say, well, John, how do I know the day of my death? None of us do. The Father does. So the point is to live each day as though that day were our last. Then we've got no stress, right? So you'll notice that's going on in verse 2. Uh, the other thing happening in verse 2, he says, Solomon, show yourself a man. Did you notice that when we read through it a moment ago? You know, what does it mean to be manly, to be genuinely masculine? We're going to take a good look at that these next few weekends. But as I said, a man's man is a godly man. That we know for sure. Now, in verses 3 and 4 here, there's some very interesting things that are reinforcing what we've already learned from these insights in David's heart, and it's this. Notice, he said, Solomon, observe, walk, keep, live, walk faithfully, and with all your heart. In other words, he's saying, Solomon, if you will do as I've instructed you to do, my son, in full devotion to the Lord your God, the blessing of God, the favor of God, my son, will be upon your life. You say, John, is there a point here? Oh, yeah. Here's the point. Obedience is the only maturity that God recognizes. Obedience is the only maturity that God recognizes. And so when we talk about mentoring the next generation, if we as adults, if we as parents, if we as caregivers, grandparents, and so forth, can walk in full obedience to the Lord, we give our heirs and those who follow us, our sons, our daughters and grandchildren, the very best opportunity to win big in God in their lives. Now, the Bible teaches very simply that life is a test, life is a trust, and life is is a temporary assignment. Can you remember those three things? A test, a trust, and a temporary assignment. First of all, life is a test. As we talk about mentoring the next generation, remember life is a test. The character is developed 
and revealed by tests and that all of life is a test and that God tests our faith through problems. He tests our hope by how we handle the possessions of our lives. He tests our love by how we treat people and how we respond to people. Notice the Bible says in James 1, blessed are those who endure when they are tested for when they pass the test, they'll receive the crown of life from God himself. So life's a test. Secondly, life is a trust. The Bible clearly teaches that all the stuff that we have in this life is entrusted to our care and management, that we're only stewards, that God is the owner, and we are merely managers of his stuff. He just loans us his earth while we're here on this earth for a little time. Now, there's three rewards if we steward his entrustments well. First of all, we'll be given God's affirmation. Remember when in the Bible when it says on that day, if we've done well, we receive the affirmation, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. We receive God's affirmation. Secondly, we receive a promotion. Did you notice you have been faithful in a few things in that same passage? I will put you in charge of many things. And then thirdly, we're honored by a celebration, which is this, come in and share your master's happiness. So there is an affirmation, there is a promotion, and there is a celebration when we steward well the entrustments of life. Thirdly, life on earth is a temporary assignment. Do you know what the Bible calls the brevity and the fragile nature of this amazing treasure that you and I are experiencing right now called life. The Bible says that we're a mist. We're like a fast runner. We're a poof, a breath. We are a wisp of smoke. Job puts it this way. He says, for we were born only yesterday and our days on earth are as transient as a shadow. So this life on earth is not our permanent home. It's not our final destination. In other words, this world, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, is not our home as the message would have it. So don't make ourselves too cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Isn't that good stuff? So what is seen, the Bible tells us, is temporary. What is unseen is Uh, is eternal. And if you're wondering, hey, John, why have I never felt completely satisfied on earth? I mean, fully down to the deepest intimate part of who I am. Here's the answer. Because ultimately, we were created for more. Because ultimately, this world, this life is not our forever home. When this life ends for you and me, when we die, it is not the end. Because at death, we won't Leave our home at death. Count on it. We are going home. Some of you need to know that today. At death, we are going home. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So keep all these things in mind when we talk number nine about mentoring the next generation. Let's move to number 10. Here it is. Fill it in. David taught us the heart value that's vital in the sight of God of being repentant of sin. Not being just sorry because we got caught, but understanding the implications of repentance when we fail, when we sin, when we mess up. You know why? Because we all will. Me, you, all of us. He was repentant of sin. Uh, Would you join me at Psalm 51? Listen to these hallowed words. David, after having committed adultery with Bathsheba, having ordered the murder, the assassination of her husband Uriah to cover up his sexual immorality, David wrote these words after God's prophet Nathan came to David and confronted him with his conduct. David says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Remember verse two there, we're going to come back to it, that washing and that cleansing. 
Third, verse 3, For I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me. Against you, O God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you prove right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely, O God, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. So cleanse me. Wash me. There's that idea of, again, of a cleansing and a washing. Again, we're going to return there. We're going to unpack that in a moment. Verse number 10, hide your face from my sins, blot out my iniquity. So create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Down to verse 16. Oh God, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. Verse 17 is very vital. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken, contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Now keep Psalm 51 open on your lap. Uh, let's, uh, let's try to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about what may be going on here. Let me mention a comment about timing of the writing of Psalm 51 in reference to David actually committing uh, adultery and murder. Because you're, we might be inclined to think that this all happened in a day or two or three or five. No, no. Months happened. So David really did not repent, if we're going to be honest with each other, until he was busted. Okay? Uh, first of all, Bathsheba has to figure out that she's pre pregnant. And then she's got to know that it's David who has fathered the child, not her husband Uriah, who's been away at battle for a long time. It could not have been her husband. It had to be David when he forced her and forced himself upon her. Secondly, then David tries to cover up the sin by bringing Uriah far, far away home from the battlefield. That takes time. Then Uriah spends time in Jerusalem while David tries to coerce him to go and spend some time with his wife. That cover-up fails, so now David sends Uriah back to Joab and the army to the battle lines far, far away, literally with his own death warrant in his hands, Uriah not knowing that, right? Months have passed before David is confronted by God's prophet Nathan with the truth of what he's done. Second thing I want to know, or I want to suggest is, before we write David off and say, you know, David's a pathetic loser. You know, he should have known better after all God did for him. Well, you know what? Haven't you and I both done stuff that we way knew better? We knew a lot better than doing what we did, and we did it anyhow. We need to look at this as a despairing evening deep in the years of David's middle age when arguably he was at the pinnacle of power and simply on that night lust got the better of David. You say, well, John, how uh, can the holy and the sinful simultaneously coexist? Here's what happens. I think in my life and in your life, if we're going to be honest with each other now, right, there's a part of us that's an emerging holiness and genuine spirituality and integrity and so forth, there's a part of us that is yet undone. And sometimes we can be incredibly selfish and sinful, can't we? Those moments can emerge in different measures, in unguarded moments, out of the same heart and life, but they both dwell there because they're refracted through the different lens at different times in the same life of that complex human being. I'm saying maybe we could cut David and each other a little grace from time to time. Remember, sin is its own judgment. We don't need to pile on people. Usually we've invited painful consequences when we have done things that we know we're not right to do. Right? Does that make sense? Now, we look through this passage of Scripture, so what I want to do is I want to just have you fill in a few key words. In verses 1 and 2, did you notice David communicates to us a right understanding of God? 
In verses 2 through 5, we see a right understanding of sin. In verses 6 through 12, the right understanding of a pure inner life. In verses 13 through 15, right understanding of the lost. In verses 16 through 19, right understanding of God's heart. So remember when Jesus came, he said, Moses brought the law, but I bring grace and truth. And we need to be balanced in a grace plus truth approach when we confront the broken moments of our lives and in the lives of other people. Remember, the Bible says this, that when you or I see another person sin, that approach them with a redemptive spirit of grace to restore them. The, the emphasis in the New Testament teaching is to restore people, not grind people down in guilt and condemnation and, and heap judgment on them, right? The idea of God is always restorative, even though we've invited very painful consequences in our life. Remember, truth without grace is legalism. And if you're in the house this weekend and you struggle with legalism, I say to you, be done with it. I say to you, walk away from it. Because with the judgment you use toward other people, that very same judgment will come back to you. Grace without truth is license. And it's honestly just kind of a moral debauchery. Grace plus truth embraces the Lordship of Jesus Christ and brings us to the place of maturity. Now, when we read through this passage, I said that there were um, a, a, a concept which keeps reemerging in David's repentance poem, which is really what Psalm 51 is. I mean, he's busted. You know, he's guilty. He's caught red-handed, right? He says in verse 2 and then down again in verse 7. Check it out with me. Do you notice, wash away, cleanse me. Wash away, cleanse me. Now, I uh, have done a little um, study in Hebrew. The word, and I'm doing my best to pronounce it, is kabseni, which is the idea of wash me. And it's the root word for the modern Hebrew word for laundry. Now, some of you just panicked because you said, man, <laughs> you just reminded me. I left the washer dryer on when I came to church today. Yeah, truly, this idea of wash me or cleanse me is the Hebrew word for laundry, which is where we get the biblical idea of the washer's field or the fuller's field when wool was prepared uh, to be a sewn into clothing for people, right? So I did a little study in both Baker's Encyclopedia and in Wikipedia. And if you check out the whole idea of fulling in terms of the preparation of raw wool, uh, in terms of creating clothes for people, fulling is the critical step in that process of wool and cloth making, right? Now, you say, okay, so what? Because our modern you know, manufacturing of clothing is so easy. We never see it. It just shows up in the store, whether we shop at Target, Walmart, you know, Macy's, Nordstrom, whatever our deal is, right? You know, Banana Republic. Some of you people are Banana Republic people. Never been to one of those. Don't think I'm going to be at one of those anytime soon, but you know what I'm saying, right? In days of antiquity, after a piece of cloth was woven, uh, it still contained a lot of oil from the fleece and also some dirt. And so a process called fulling had to be done to cleanse the cloth and ready it for use. Uh, the fulling of cloth making involved the cleansing of the cloth, especially when it was wool, to eliminate oil, dirt, impurities, and also it made it thicker. So fulling actually involved two processes, scouring and milling it. That's the thickening part of it. Now, here's what happened in the fulling process. It was carried out by a pounding process, right? Uh, the, the wool was pounded at, by the fuller's feet or maybe by his or her hands or even by a club. 
and then followed a very aggressive stretching process on great frames known as tenters, to which uh, are, they're attached by tenter hooks. Are you following me? Now, in Roman times, we know factually and archaeologically, historically, that f this very fulling was conducted by slaves who would do the pounding, do the stretching, and then they would put the cloth ankle deep, I'm, I'm sorry to be gross, ankle deep in tubs of human urine. Really. Now, urine was so important to the fulling business uh, that it was even taxed. There was a tax on human urine. So again, sorry to be gross. Uh, stale urine was known as the washing part of the fulling process, and it was a source of the ammonium, of the salts, and it assisted in the cleansing and the whitening of this cloth, which is being prepared to be sewn into clothing. Now, the fuller's work area would obviously be outside the town gates and walls for a couple reasons. First of all, because of the offensive odors. <laughs> Secondly, because there was space needed to spread the fibers out for drying. You say, John, is there a point here? Oh yeah, there always is, and eventually I get to it. David has said twice in Psalm 51, Oh God, I have sinned. I have committed sexual immorality, adultery, and I have committed murder, the ultimate capital crime. Oh God, cleanse me. Oh God, wash me. This is exactly what David had in mind when God's Holy Spirit inspired Psalm 51's poem of repentance in David's heart this fulling process. David is asking God to take him out to the woodshed. David is asking God to beat him. David is asking God to give him a powerful cleansing. David is asking God to remove all of his guilt. David is teaching us that repentance is not easy. See, we think it's easy. Oh, got busted. Okay, won't do that again. And we go out and promptly we do do it again. But David says, no, no. Demonstrate repentance by changed conduct. Repentance is not easy. It is hard. It is searing. It is crushing. It is acidic. It is stretching. And it is prolonged. And it is necessary to become a man or woman of God. Those are the 10 qualities that we see, and there are more, but that I just wanted to share with you as your pastor, as we continue in this series in the life of David. Can I tell you what those six habits look like very simply for growing that kind of a David heart? We talk about them in our culture all the time at Calvary Temple Church. And we only have six. If you're new with us this weekend at CTC, we don't have 25 or 41 or 117 things we want you to remember. Just six. And in fact, they're there on your notes. Let's whip through them super quick. Fill them out as we go along. If you're going to cultivate the kinds of everyday habits that will grow in us a David heart, this is what it's going to look like. First of all, to attend a weekend gathering. You say, John, what's that? Exactly what we're doing uh, right now. And again, usually I teach live and, and not by video. So a weekend gathering will guide us to the place where we have a big church experience with the larger family of God every single weekend. We need it. Secondly, uh, participate in a small group. And if, if uh, a weekend gathering is big church, uh, a small group, of course, it's small church. And it's all about relationship, isn't it? Um, if you only attend on the weekends, that's a great start but you're going to dwarf your spiritual potential because you're just going to be a name lost in a big crowd and you need to begin to develop a huddle of little relationships with half a dozen people where you can begin to do life together. And here's the reason, because we are better together. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if we want to go far, we've got to go together because we are better together. The third life habit is this, daily time with God in Bible reading and prayer. It is the first and most essential habit to all spiritual formation. Fourth habit is this, to use our gifts and our passions from God in ministry to serve God and to serve people. 
It's not healthy for us to come and take, 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 take. Jesus said, hey, guys, gals, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we give by, by uh, leveraging our lives, by serving in ministry. Number five is this, to share our faith in Christ with those who are far from him. Um, did you know the Bible teaches Jesus came because the New Testament radically reinforces this truth. Lost people matter. A lot. And that value will never change in the DNA of this church family or of this Christ follower, servant shepherd. Um, Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save the lost. And he wants to follow us in his steps and be about that habit in our daily lives. And then finally, we tithe in faith and obedience. So those are the, the six habits which will best position us to grow a David heart. A weekend gathering, a regular small group experience, daily Bible reading and prayer, serving in ministry, sharing our faith with those that are far from him, tithing, and resourcing this family of believers to change the East Bay and to impact the world. Just those six habits. That's what boots on the ground, the practical steps of full devotion and nurturing legitimately a David Hart really looks like. Now, I want to wrap up uh, with this thought when we think about growing a David Hart. I mean, what would happen if every one of us lived what we've been talking about? What's kind of the overarching theme of what we've learned about David's heart over these weeks and months past. I want to illustrate with this little, um, uh, this item that you may see here uh, where I'm teaching uh, this weekend on the little table I have here. Um, this is a genuine artifact from the era of David. And I know this because when you buy any uh, item of antiquity from David's era or any era biblically, you will get from the Israeli government, their Department of Archaeology, you'll get a certificate of antiquity. Uh, what I have in my hands here is this is actually an oil lamp uh, during David's time. So we're talking 3,000 years ago. And then this is actually sort of a little vase uh, or sort of a little pitcher. Both of these would be receptacles for olive oil. Uh, the vase, this little pitcher, might also hold perfume. In days of antiquity, remember, Israel was on the globes uh, of the empires of antiquity. It was on the main trade and commerce routes. So people bringing precious spices and perfumes and olive oil, although olive oil was uh, produced locally in Israel, uh, you could have access to perfumes that you might store in a vial like this, okay? Women also wore them in little receptacles around their necks uh, in biblical era as well. So we know that these were discovered uh, in the actual city of David, which is just a part, a small part of what is the city of Jerusalem today. Uh, we know uh, it's what was the capital during the time of David's actual life. It's made of terracotta. I mentioned that it holds olive oil, which had so many uses in biblical era, not the least of which is to light lamps at nighttime so you'd have at least a little bit of illumination. And can you imagine the ancient hands that held and formed this ancient 3,000-year-old oil lamp uh, in days of antiquity? I mean, just imagine uh, when it arrived, by the way, from the uh, archaeological dealer in Jerusalem from whom I purchased it, it was broken. I hate to tell you this, but I glued it together with super glue from Walmart. Oh, well. Uh, and so that's what these cracks are on the side here. He actually sent me another one because they guarantee they'll arrive unbroken. Oops. Now, uh, keeping this in mind, I want to read a final Bible verse to you, and it's in Psalm 119, verse 105. 
remember, the Bible can never mean what the Bible never meant. Here it is. Your word, O God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When the ancient psalmist had in mind God's word, the word of God, which we've been studying, we study it every week, every day uh, around this uh, faith family called Calvary Temple Church. When we do that, God's word is compared in the Bible to a lamp or a light. And this is what they had in mind. Uh, This center portion would be filled with olive oil. A little wick would come out the spout. It would be lit. And you'll notice it fits nicely in the hand. And this is how people would move about their house after dark or maybe go from their little hut to the neighbor's little hut or stand outside or whatever it is that they're doing. But the thing I want you to know uh, about these very ancient rudimentary forms of life, it would only light one step at a time. Notice the biblical insight here. One step at a time. In other words, God wants you and me to have every step dependence upon him. Sometimes he doesn't give us enough light. Most of the time he does not to take two steps or three steps before we trust him again. No, no. We trust him. We depend upon him. We believe him. We love him. We take one step. And then when we've taken one step with this uh, illuminating lamp, Then, because we've moved the lamp in our body forward, now there's enough light to take what? One more step. And then what about the next point after that? One more step after that, you get the idea. God wants us to have an every step dependence upon him who is the lover of our soul. Please remember that. That's the essence of a David heart, having an every step dependence dependence on the one who knows us best and loves us most. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all our ways. Acknowledge him and he will what? He will direct our paths. Why? Because he loves us. Let's pray. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, that you let the truths of Holy Scripture be illumined in our hearts and lives and not stop there, but be lived out every day in ways that matter and transform so that we become. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, I love you so much. See you next weekend.